Love Hila Podrick Sonadiv. Happy St. Patrick's Day. That first one was maybe in Irish. I asked six different people from Ireland how to say it, and they all gave me something slightly different. So let's just stick with St. Patrick's Day. The day when we of Irish descent and those of non-Irish descent come together clad in green and drink a pint of Guinness. So in honor of that patron saint of Ireland who was not Irish, I'm going to show you how to make a nice bowl of Stovach Gaela, or Irish stew, using a recipe from 1900. We'll also take a look at one of the most important, if heartbreaking, episodes in Irish history, the Great Potato Famine. So thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video as we celebrate St. Paddy's Day. So I actually had a lot of trouble finding an historic recipe for something Irish from Ireland. Most of the recipes that I could find from the 18th or 19th century that had Irish dishes were actually from England, written by English authors. And I don't know why that is, but I can venture a guess based on how the English treated the Irish, especially in the 18th and 19th century. But a viewer named Jackie Murphy did send me an Irish cookbook from the year 1900, not only from Ireland, but written in Irish. So that is what we'll be cooking from today. Stova Gela, Irish stew. Ingredients, one half pound lean mutton, one quarter pound bacon, two onions, 12 potatoes, one half pint water, salt and pepper. Method, cut the meat into neat pieces. Clean, peel and wash the potatoes, peel and cut the onions, Put a layer of potatoes in the pot, a layer of meat on top of that, onions, salt and pepper, and so on until the pot is full. Have a layer of potatoes on top. Pour in the water and turn on the fire. Let it boil, pull it to the side, and let it simmer an hour and a half. Take it up. Put the meat in the middle, the potatoes around it, and the grease down on it. I have to say, as someone who's used to reading medieval or ancient recipes, this one sure is a breath of fresh air. It's just so easy to follow. Just like those from our sponsor today, HelloFresh. After a long day of writing or filming, HelloFresh makes making a meal quite easy. Not having to go to the grocery store makes Max very happy. HelloFresh delivers meals right to your door with all of the ingredients already measured out for you, so nothing goes to waste. And the recipes are easy to follow and they are quick, which I really appreciate. Most take no more than 30 minutes to prepare. The other night we made the pork sausage rigatoni in a creamy sauce and loved it. Quality sausage and fresh vegetables with a light creamy sauce that had just enough spice. And next time, I wouldn't mind getting one of their optional sides of garlic bread, which I hear is a bestseller. So just go to HelloFresh.com and use code TASTINGHISTORY12 to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Another great thing about HelloFresh is that if you want more protein, you can order some. They're very flexible. Something that you might also want to do with today's stew, because you'll notice by the ingredient amounts that the amount of meat to potatoes is... Well, not a lot of meat. Meat was expensive then, so yeah. But going with the recipe, what you'll need is a half pound or 225 grams of mutton or lamb, a quarter pound or 113 grams of bacon. So this is Irish bacon or back bacon, and if you can find that, that's what you want to use. But in the US, it is hard to find, so go ahead and use Canadian ham um, or Canadian bacon. That's going to be the closest thing. Just don't use American bacon because it's very, very different. Two onions, chopped. 12 potatoes, washed, peeled, and chopped. So what size is a potato? What size were potatoes in 1900? I'm not entirely sure. I went with fairly small ones, but you can get smaller. Um, don't use big baking potatoes, or if you do, then obviously don't use 12 of those. Probably three would be fine. 10 ounces or 295 milliliters of water. And you're gonna have to be flexible on that because one, it might boil away and you don't want that. Also, depending on the size of your vegetables, it, it's gonna vary, so just work with me. And some salt and pepper. So usually I would sear the meat before putting it into the pot, but this recipe is actually pretty specific in how it wants it like layered, so I ain't searing, and neither is he. I used to think his name was Searin Hines, but it's actually pronounced Kieran or Kieran Hines, my favorite Irish actor. So put a layer of your potatoes on the bottom of a large stew pot, and then top that with a layer of the mutton or lamb, and then the bacon, then the onion, and add the salt and pepper, and finally another layer of the potato. Potatoes. Then pour in your water and set it over high heat. Once it's boiling, turn down the heat and let it simmer for 90 minutes. Also, my favorite thing about this dish was the sound of the simmering. 
If there is a sound that was like a warm hug, that is it. Also, notice that there is not a lot of water for this stew in comparison with a modern stew. A lot of older stew recipes have very, very little broth, um, but you, you still don't want it to boil completely away or it will burn, so do add a little bit more if you need, but it's not like a soup. So we are making this Irish stew in honor of St. Patrick's Day, one of my favorite holidays, partly because I am obsessed with traditional Irish music. And until recently, and even now, the holiday is much bigger here in the United States than in Ireland itself. And that's partly because we here in the US have seven times more people of Irish descent than Ireland has. And the reason that my ancestors, and oh so many of our ancestors, came over from Ireland is none too pleasant but it is a very important chapter in food history. So just as the 12 potatoes in our stew might suggest, the Irish have always had a love of spuds. Actually, that's not quite true, because it wasn't until 1589 that Sir Walter Raleigh introduced the potato to Ireland. And even then, it actually took quite some time for it to really take off, but once it did, boy howdy, it really became the staple crop of many of the poor soiled areas of Hibernia, or Ireland. Unfortunately, it grew so well that it actually became the sole crop for much of the population, especially the poorer population, and that's something called monoculture, and even in the 1840s, they knew that that could be a dangerous thing. It would be impossible adequately to describe the privations which the Irish laborer and his family habitually and silently endure. In many districts, their only food is the potato, their only beverage, water. All well and good if you like potatoes and water, and if your potatoes don't have blight. Now that quote was from the Earl of Devon in February of 1845. And the previous year, Irish newspapers had talked about crops failing in the eastern United States due to a potato blight, which is kind of like a fungus, but isn't. But it was all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, and even if it did come to Ireland, that was okay because the Irish had dealt with parts of their potato crop failing before. But then in 1845, just months after the Earl of Devon's report on the state of Irish families, the blight did come to Ireland, and it was very different than it had been before. Because instead of just hitting certain parts of the country, it hit all of the country. And the population had grown quite a bit since the last time that a crop had failed. Up to 8 million people now lived in Ireland. Now, much of Northern Europe was dealing with this same blight, so when news from Ireland came to Sir Robert Peel, the Prime Minister in London, he admitted that the reports were very alarming, but also that there was always a tendency to exaggeration in Irish news. Spoiler alert, they were not exaggerating. One William Trench, a land agent in County Cork, wrote, The leaves of the potatoes on many fields I passed were quite withered, and a strange stench such as I had never smelt before, but which became a well-known feature for years after, filled the atmosphere adjoining each field of potatoes. The crop of all crops, on which they depended for food, had suddenly melted away. By the end of 1845, half of the potato crop had been lost to blight, and in 1846, three quarters were lost, making it hard to plant future potatoes for the next year. Now, to be fair to Prime Minister Peel, he did try to take some action. He secretly bought 100,000 pounds of American corn, or maize, from the US. And it had to be secret because the British corn laws forbade the import of low-cost grain. And he did finally get those laws repealed, but he had to go against his party to do so, and we will get back to that in a bit. Now, unfortunately, the mills in Ireland were not properly equipped to grind maize in the right way, nor were the Irish people properly equipped to digest it. It made many ill, and it became known as Peel's Brimstone. And I kind of wonder if the process of nixtamalization had not gone over to Ireland with the corn. And if you don't nixtamalize corn, it's very, very hard to, to digest it properly, or at least get most of the nutrients from it. And I really go into depth on that in the quesadilla and the tamale episode, so if you want to watch those, I'll put a link in the description. But well digested or not, at least something was getting through to Ireland for them to eat. Unfortunately, that wasn't going to last very long. Because, as I mentioned, Peel had to go against his party, and in doing so, he peeled the party apart. And this new split party made way for a new prime minister, the Whig Party's Lord John Russell. 
Now, it is not fair in a 15-minute video, or however long this video ends up being, to pass judgment on John Russell's entire career. He was a very complicated man, as were British politics at the time. But when it comes to Ireland, he gets an F. See, Russell put a man named Charles Trevelyan in charge of the government relief program. But unfortunately, Trevelyan didn't believe in government relief. And he would say things like, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. The real evil with which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the people. Shockingly, he was not a popular man in Ireland. The best thing that he did was send people to workhouses. And even then, the workhouses were overcrowded and couldn't take everyone. And the conditions were so abhorrent that, in the words of Charles Dickens, Many can't go there, and many would rather die. And if A Christmas Carol hadn't been published three years earlier, I would really think that Ebenezer Scrooge was based on Charles Trevelyan. But he wasn't alone in his disdain for the Irish. Much of the English population blamed the Irish for their plight because they were dependent on one crop. The ones who often blamed them the most were the landlords. And the landlords were mostly English, living in England, and had never or very rarely went to Ireland. One bailiff at an eviction in 1846 was quoted as saying, What the devil do we care about you or your black potatoes? It was not us that made them black. You will get two days to pay the rent, and if you don't, you know the consequences. So like I said, one reason that people often blame the Irish was because they were dependent on one crop. You fools, they said. But in actuality, the Irish were growing lots of different crops. Unfortunately, much of that was going to feed cattle, which most of the Irish population could not afford. They couldn't afford beef. And that grain that wasn't going to feed cattle wasn't usually staying in Ireland. The circumstances which appeared most aggravating was that the people were starving in the midst of plenty, and that every tide carried from the Irish ports corn sufficient for the maintenance of thousands of the Irish people. Now records show that that food being exported was still not enough to cover the entirety of the uh, potato crop that was lost, but even so, one cow gone is one cow too many. So clearly the government was not much help, nor were the landlords, and so the Irish came to depend on the kindness of strangers. There are records of donations being sent in by the Tsar of Russia, the city of Calcutta, the Pope, the young congressman Abraham Lincoln, and the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Now this might be a legend, but it's said that the Sultan offered to donate 10,000 pounds, and he was actually convinced to lower that to 1,000 pounds so as not to outshine the 2,000 pound donation that Queen Victoria made. It's kind of like too horrible not to be true. One of the most famous donations came in 1847 and was for $170, and it came from the Choctaw Nation, who only 16 years before had been moved from Mississippi to Oklahoma on the infamous Trail of Tears. It came from a people who very recently had experienced extreme starvation, and even then were still very, very poor. And in 2017, there was a monument in County Cork that was erected called Kindred Spirits, dedicated to the relationship between the Choctaw and the Irish. And I really wish that I had been able to see it last time that I was there a couple years ago, but I didn't. So, reason to go back. Perhaps the most impactful relief, though, came from the Society of Friends, or the Quakers, who donated tons of food, literally tons of food, and orchestrated it so that the railroads carried, free of charge, all packages marked Ireland. They also started soup kitchens, which, even though the soup kitchens were always overwhelmed, was one of the best things that did happen during the famine. And their soup kitchens came with no strings attached. If you came and you wanted food, you, you got food as long as there was food left to give. That couldn't be said about all of the soup kitchens, though. Protestant Bible societies set up soup kitchens around the country that would only serve the Irish Catholics if they converted. And those that, you know, were desperate enough, they were starving that, so that they did convert, ended up being called supers by, by their fellow Irish people. And it was a stigma that lasted for generations. 
all the way up until the 1920s, there are records of people being called supers as a derogatory uh, name, basically synonymous with traitor. The other alternative that most people had if they were starving was to leave Ireland altogether. Now, there had been a great deal of immigration to America from Ireland for centuries at that point, but it was the Great Famine that really kicked it into high gear. And many of those same English landlords who were evicting many of their tenants were offering to pay the passage for tenants that hadn't been evicted because there was a tax uh, to help pay for the famine and the relief, there was a tax on those landlords, and it was based on how many tenants they had, and so they found it easier to send them off to America rather than pay that tax. So between 1845 and 1851, there were over a million deaths and a great deal of emigration, so that the population fell from 8 million to 6.5 million, and down to 4.5 million by the end of the century. And it was actually this depopulation, more than anything else, that finally ended the Great Famine. And the Irish census of 1851 callously starts, We feel it will be gratifying to your excellency to find that the population has been diminished in so remarkable a manner by famine, disease, and emigration. The results of the Irish census of 1851 are, on the whole, satisfactory, demonstrating as they do the general advancement of the country. And Trevelyan, that Thanos-like head of the government relief effort, said that the famine had been a direct stroke of an all-wise and all-merciful providence, the sharp but effectual remedy by which the cure is likely to be effected. I hate that guy. Anyway, that is your history of the Great Irish Potato Famine. So, while you're drinking your pints of Guinness and painting shamrocks on your face or whatever else you do for St. Paddy's Day, do spare a thought for the reason why so many of our ancestors left their homes in the first place. Definitely a downer. What is not a downer is a wonderful bowl of Irish stew. So once your stew is cooked for about an hour and a half, it should be all ready to dish up. Now the recipe says that you're supposed to put the meat in the middle and then the potatoes around that and then put some sauce or whatever juice is left over over that. But seeing as it's in layers, I don't really get how you're going to do that because the potatoes would need to be first. And so if you, if you mix it all up, then that's not going to work unless you're picking out meat and potatoes. I just put mine in a bowl. And here we are. Stova Gela, or Irish stew. It looks so much simpler than what you'd find in an Irish pub or whatever, because um, usually they put a lot of other vegetables and there's, like I said, a lot more juice and stuff, but um, it smells divine. Let's give it a shot. This is an evening sitting by the fire, wrapped in a blanket with the cats and those that you love in a bowl. This is the happiest meal that I have had in a long time, and I wish now that I had made twice as much because I'm going to be eating this all week. It's wonderful. It's cooked all the way through. The, the meat is not dried out. Um, you know, we didn't sear it, so I, but it's wonderful. It's plenty moist. There's tons of flavor. The onion really, I used sweet or yellow onion, so it really added a lot of that, that flavor, and then I, I did use a good amount of pepper. Um, oh, it's just, it's divine. I love this. This is a wonderful meal. And I bet it's going to taste even better the second day, because that's what stews like this do. Now, for those who are still watching, there's a little poem about Irish stew from 1828 that I want to share with you. It's, it's long, so I'm going to just share a couple stanzas, but it's just adorable. If you'd ask a young lover to dine, and have him prove kind unto you, to make love come out of his beautiful mouth, you should stuff it with Irish stew. Then hurrah for an Irish stew that will stick to your belly like glue. It's seasoned so fine, and its flavor's divine. Oh, good luck to an Irish stew. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code TASTINGHISTORY12 to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. And I will see you next time on Tasting History. Mmm. Just lovely. <laughs>